Hello everyone, my name is Jonas. Um, welcome to my talk about a game we made called Subnautica. Um, first of all, what is Subnautica? Subnautica is a first person, single player, underwater adventure game. What, is, what about it? Uh, can you hear it? Wait a second. Can you only hear this or, or can you hear me here? This is much louder, right? I can, I can try speaking into this one. It is on. Okay. Um, single player, first person underwater adventure. And uh, this, is, this is how it works. You, you crash land on an alien planet. You dive in, and you scavenge resources, you craft and build to survive, you construct tools and vehicles, you pilot the vehicles, you build habitats, and make them your own, you bring your vehicles into your habitats, you explore an open world full of diverse biomes, caves, threads, bigger threads, mystery, more mystery, and spectacle, a lot of spectacle. You unravel the story by going down all the way to the core to the discover the secret of the planet, and then you blast off back to Earth at the end. And the entire thing takes about 30 hours. So like I said, Subnautica is a first-person, single-player, underwater adventure, but it's also an open-world exploration and sandbox survival game with a story. So let's talk about Subnautica as a product. Subnautica was released on PC and Mac on Steam January 2018, a price point of 25 US dollars, and sold 2 million copies. That's good. Uh, we had over 50k concurrent players on launch day. We got 93% positive user reviews at about 70k reviews total, and a 87% Metacritic score. We are currently working on bringing Subnautica to consoles and other platforms. So Subnautica has been successful as a commercial product. That's all good. But how did we build it? Let me take you behind the scenes. So it all started with a plan. We wanted to make something small for a change. We had just made Natural Selection 2, and that took like six years. So this time we wanted something small, maybe in Unity, perhaps a casual game made by a small team of like four people in about six months. But in reality, we ended up with a, uh, with a big project, still using Unity, targeting beefy hardware made by a team of 25 over the course of five years. And it cost us 10 million US dollars to make. How did that happen? And where did all the money come from? Let me tell you. <laughs> so I'm going to take you all the way from the rough idea to early access to the launch of the final product. I'm going to show you what we learned in the process, the major changes we made along the way, what makes Subnautica stand out from the crowd. And I'm going to show you how we work as a team, how we interact with our community, how we do marketing. If there's time at the end, but probably not because this is like 15 minutes shorter, um, uh, I have some practical tips and tricks uh, for Unity, but you can come to me after the talk and I can show it to you. So let's start with the idea. Um, so our company, Unawards Entertainment, is pretty small, and we're indies um, uh, with no big money. We cannot compete with AAA, so instead of competing, we make games that nobody else makes. And there's a book called Blue Ocean Strategy, which is about finding uncontested market space. And in our case, uh, the uncontested market space we're trying to find, well, it's, it's the year 2013, uh, and Minecraft is hugely successful. Don't Starve just created the entire genre of survival games, basically, from scratch. So what if we made a game like Minecraft, but underwater? Uh, a survival sandbox like Don't Starve, but with diving, right? In space, on an alien planet, and no guns, because in the US there was a horrible school shooting, and we felt like we shouldn't make yet another game about shooting things. So that was our initial pitch. As you know, there are thousands of indie games out there. So our goal is to stand out in the sea of games. Our goal is to be spiky. And those spikes will surely alienate some players, but others will, will love it uh, even more so. We believe that making games for everyone is basically making games for no one. So what are our spikes? Our initial idea was this. An underwater sci-fi themed game, uh, like the movie Deep Is, where players uh, design and build custom submarines 
and explore a procedural world and all that without guns and violence, right? So that, that seemed good. Uh, we got an idea, we got four developers, it's time for prototyping. Our first prototype looked like this. It was focused on vessel building. Players would build submarines out of blocky rooms and then drive them around to gather loot scattered across the ocean floor. And we had this modulus control, control scheme where players were supposed to work together, a co-op, um, to, to pilot the sub. And it turns out that was just super tedious and not very uh, interesting. But the feeling of, of uh, being underwater was there. Uh, the emotions, uh, the uh, fear of the uh, ocean, the emotions were working. The gameplay was not. So we iterated on the prototype. For the second prototype, we tried to get rid of the tedious aspects and centralize the controls and also made the uh, construction grid more granular to allow for more modular ship uh, building parts, which allowed us to accommodate for an art style without glass floors, the ones that you saw before, uh, yeah, that glass floor, so that you can see what you're, uh, what you're driving over. Um, playing that prototype, we discovered that exploration is way more exciting than building submarines. So for the third prototype, we tried to make submarines more interesting. Uh, so we added flooding. Uh, when, when you dive too deep or you drive into things, then, then it floods and uh, it, it eventually you drown in your own submarine. Right? Flooding worked great. It was really uh, a good tense mechanic. So we get discovered one thing. We can have tension without without violence, without guns. Right? And we also discovered that fear and tension are compelling emotions that make players come back for more. That's a lesson uh, for you if you are making prototypes, aim for feelings, aim for feelings first. We continued uh, adding more gameplay to our prototype, more crafting, proper inventory system, and then we switched from like a height map terrain to a voxel based terrain, which enabled us to uh, add caves, claustrophobic caves to the game, adding even more tension when you dive and uh, you run out of oxygen. And eventually we realized it's better to start with nothing and then work your way up in a survival game. So we removed the submarine, we added this static room with a crafting station instead. And, uh, you walk up to this crafting station and there you can build your first submarine. And, and players understand that intuitively, right? They understand the inherent value of having a submarine in a, in, a, in a diving game. We didn't have to make that a quest or a mission or, or anything, an achievement. So we discovered intrinsic rewards are much more compelling than quests. Intrinsic rewards create true motivation for the players and, again, make them want to play more, want to make them come back. So in summary, we learned a few things from those prototypes. We learned that we can add intrinsic rewards through uh, tech progression. Uh, we can add gating to, through oxygen management, um, tension through flooding, and all those are good things uh, that uh, lead to good gameplay. And we also learned that modular submarines with modular controls really only look good on paper, but in practice are terrible. What was great about the prototypes were the sense of exploration, discovery, wonder, fear, and tension. So feelings, like I said, right? aim for the feelings. And we also learned that underwater survival works really great for uh, those kind of intrinsic rewards we were uh, setting up. So we updated our spikes. Submarine building was no longer important to us. Instead, uh, we wanted to focus on an experiential core game. In the meantime, our art director has been busy concepting. And he was drawing these uh, coral reefs and lush biomes full of uh, wonder and peril and uh, beautiful submarines as well, right? And <laughs> the problem was our prototypes looked nothing like that. So can we, can we even achieve that look? Therefore, it's time for proof of concept. Our new goal is to match the concept art as fast as possible. Forget about all the um, procedural terrain, co-op, gameplay. Forget about all that, just match the look, right? Make, make a pro, uh, project prototype that runs fast enough and looks like that. So we set our target to be PAX East, April 2014. And we quickly realized that we need a lot of art assets and level design to, to match the look. So we added lots and lots and of artists to the small team. Fast forward to PAX. We made it. This is the Subnautica booth. 
The player said, our game has beautiful graphics. There's an in-game screenshot, an intriguing concept, and they had really visceral reactions swimming with the sharks, so the, the emotions of being underwater, they worked, even though there was absolutely no gameplay in there. Uh, we even had the submarine, uh, the Cyclops, we call it, in there, and players could drive it. But it was kind of lame because there wasn't, there wasn't anything uh, to do with it. There was no gameplay, like I said. What we learned from uh, the, the proof of concept was that we can match uh, beautiful concept art and that the game has potential. And we learned that the tiny handmade world we made for the demo that is, uh, is much more Sorry, it's much more interesting than any kind of procedural terrain we, we came up with before. Um, we learned that thalassophobia and bathophobia, the fear of the vast emptiness and the, uh, of the sea and the fear of depth, are like strong real-world emotions that transfer into the game world. And so if you have something like that in your game, exploit the hell out of it, right? Uh, you, get, you get excitement for free. Um, we also learned that we have a serious performance problem. We had really low FPS and hitching, and uh, so something had to be done there. But we really liked the new look. So let's update our spikes. For forget about procedural world, uh, handcraft, all the things. Uh, and people fear the ocean, so exploit that. These are our new spikes. We're confident enough in the potential of our game to move forward. So it's time to build our minimum viable product. Forget about, uh, initially we were uh, thinking about like iPhone and tablets and all that, but forget about that. It's way too difficult to get this running even just on PC. So let's keep the look and bring back the loot and the crafting and the gameplay. And, uh, let's add more worlds to explore. But that's going to require better voxel editing tools and we need more level designers and more programmers for all of that. So the team grew and grew. Half a year later, October 2013, we had four biomes, some creatures, some crafting, still no submarines because we were do, redoing the Cyclops. Um, we basically had a combination of the gameplay prototype uh, you saw before and the visual proof of concept. We felt that our game was ready for play, player feedback, so we started actually selling it on our website, uh, and we called that early, earliest access. And we added telemetry to the game to, and feedback systems to see what players are actually doing and whether they are experiencing the game the way we want them to experience it. Right? This is a top-down view of the world. The yellow parts is the fraction we had built so far. As you can see, we had a long way to go. The game itself was centered around the life pod in the middle there, uh, which contains the initial crafting station, basically the same thing as the, the, the box I showed you before in the prototypes. And we noticed one thing, players always wanted to swim to the crash ship on the horizon there, we, uh, called the Aurora, even though that is just a billboard. There's literally nothing there. But we learned that the Aurora, as the only visible net landmark above water, attracts players and they intuitively want to seek shelter or scavenge resources. So I don't know, but it, it attracts them. right? And but there's nothing there. We want them to be diving under the life pod and all that. So we added radiation around the aurora, which ramps up as, uh, as you get closer to, to shoot players away. And after that, we saw the player stayed in the shallow waters uh, here, where it's, uh, where it's safe and nice, nice creatures and all that. Um, and they avoided areas with all the dangerous creatures, and they avoided the caves because uh, you can run out of oxygen in there, and then you die, right? So being very clever game designers, we therefore started to put all the good loot in those kind of dangerous places. Uh, the game in f that we now saw like in front of us was, was already quite different from the game we initially imagined, right? We were not really making a, like a true sandbox game anymore, uh, not really a roguelike, not really a building game, not really a survival game. So we changed our pitch a bit. Our new pitch is that we are building a game where you feel like a scientist who has crash landed on an aquatic alien world that's figuring out how it works. It's a game about exploration, discovery, and theme. A game without a uh, specific goal, a game without extrinsic rewards, a game without combat and weapons. So for lack of a better term, let's call it an adventure game. And two months after that, we started selling, 
uh, after, two months after we started selling the game on our website, we had a problem because we ran out of money. Um, so we put the game on Steam Early Access, hoping for more sales. That was December 2014. And the game was in a similar state as two months before, because we put all the good loot in the uh, dangerous places. There was a, a lot of like exciting tension, so that was good. And we also added one giant whale-like creature called the Reefback. Uh, and in terms of gameplay, they, they don't do anything. All they uh, do is like swim around and make cool whale noises. And players were completely freaked out by them. So, of course, we added that to our list of spikes. Giant creatures are ter terrifying, even though they don't do anything. So with, with all this tension and fear going on, players started telling us we're actually making a horror game here, um, which was not our intent, but OK, why not? But the sales numbers itself were underwhelming, not, not enough for us to survive as a studio. We needed something to move the needle, and we needed it fast. So what would that be, right? If you're in this kind of situation, what do you do? You have a potent game that has potential. Do you add like more loot, more biomes, more dangerous creatures, multiplayer? Do you fix bugs, increase performance? You do you add something entirely new? What should we prioritize? So we looked at our spikes, and we focus on what this what makes this game stand out, right? Underwater, accidental horror, and theme. So let's only implement clear-cut features which add to those kind of spikes. Features that have to be concrete, emotional, and straightforward. Everything else can wait. We kept our heads up and shipped monthly updates, and we added a little bit more everything, but in addition to that, we added um, important headliner features for each uh, monthly update like the Cyclops submarine that we already saw, and the deadly Reaper Leviathan, scaled down here a little bit. And in terms of sales, we were starting to gain traction, which is good. Players loved the new Cyclops. It acts as a massive mobile uh, base and gels well with exploration. So we discovered a new spike there. So, and then we started seeing new players pouring in every day. Where did they come from? Just one word for you. Streamers. First, there was, uh, it was 2014. It was a time like birth of Let's Plays, right? First, there was Eat My Diction, uh, December 2014, with like half a million subscribers. And then Frankie on PC, uh, a few months later, with two million subscribers. Then came Jake Satti guy with four million subscribers. And he made a new video about Subnautica every single week. And then half a year later, uh, we had Markiplier playing the game with like 10 million subscribers. And those subscribers uh, turn into buyers of your product. So if you do marketing, aim for streamers. With all those new players, we went straight from near bankruptcy to virtually infinite budget because more money was coming in every month than we were spending. Sounds great. <laughs> Well, what do you do with that? Where do you go now? What's the scope of your project now, right? So we, again, we made a roadmap, wanted to keep our pace and focus and deliver great monthly updates. So we looked at our concept art, picked the things that gelled well with the existing systems. We picked the, uh, one of those was base building, uh, which provided like great intrinsic rewards players understand it's cool to have a base or have multiple bases. In addition to that, it comes with farming, which helps with survival, and a moon pool, which uh, uh, gels with vehicle gameplay, and a map room where you can scan for loot, which gels with exploration. So base building really gels with all the systems that were already in there, so we put that in, right? prioritized that. And we uh, also finally caved and replaced the Aurora billboard with like a 3D model and made it explorable because despite the radiation, players still just wanted to go there. So if you have something where you see players just want that, then give them what they want. Yeah. Of course, we also fleshed out our existing systems, which we know were working. So more creatures, more crafting, more biomes. One of the new biomes was a floating island. And the floating island is above water, right? So to avoid the same fiasco as with the Aurora, we just uh, hit the islands behind clouds and that actually worked great. Otherwise, people would just swim there again. Terrible. Not the game we want. No, not the gameplay we want. Everything else, we cut. All our ambitious dreams for really exciting creature gameplay, emergent food change, ritual ecosystems, all cut. 
our idea of like terraforming and building habitations to make the planet ready for colonization cut. Co-op multiplayer cut. Lots of co cosmetic stuff all cut. We were telling ourselves that we can bring back all these things, uh, uh, bring them back later if there's time. There's never time. What we didn't up, uh, did end up with, though, is, uh, was a really solid tech progression, allowing to explore deeper and deeper biomes, leading to better and better loot. Left side, biomes go deeper. Middle is uh, the tech tree. And uh, the sense of exploration and discovery, uh, those were the, uh, was, that was the most important feature, the sense of the unknown, right? So we learned that in our case, and for this game specifically, getting lost and uh, getting a little bit frustrated is actually good. Uh, any, if we added any forms of hand-holding, it would destroy the sense of the unknown because, well, clearly the game designer knows uh, about the world, right? And same goes for um, a map. It's much better to have trailblazing where, where, uh, where we empower players to leave navigation markers in the world than simply handing them a map where they can look stuff up. Um, we can still have gentle guiding uh, through the tech progression we put in. We have the soft gating where you cannot go very deep uh, at first and then later you can. Uh, so we have we can create this non-linear experience that doesn't feel completely random. And we don't have to put explicit missions or hard gates in the game to control what is going on. And we think that's very powerful. We also learned that in our case, it's best to build the world first without thinking about gameplay, pacing, loot balance, and all these things. The world just is. Everything else we can design around that. Very different from how games are traditionally being made, but in our case, it's important because it's all about the unknown. So the game was pretty great. We had this cool survival sandbox exploration adventure that starts with nothing but a small life pod at the top, right, and then branches out and goes wider and wider and deeper and deeper. But 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 then what? What what's the point? Uh, is there a point? Well, it's, so we discussed many different solutions, but one of them really stuck out. In, in the very early days of prototyping, our technical artist had doodled something that intrigued us. It was uh, this epic chart of exploring deeper and deeper parts of the ocean, descending into caves and in eventually aliens. We quite liked that. So we realized that what we really need is a core narrative to pull everything together, uh, a story. So we hired a writer, and, we came, and he came up with a whole bunch of like mysteries, and including aliens and a story that eventually led to building a rocket and escaping the planet. And uh, all the sandbox parts came together to, to a grand finale. Worked great for us. It all makes sense now. Story was the last missing piece here for our spikes. To tell the story in a truly non-linear fashion, we came up with a whole story goal event system, which manipulates uh, the player's progress and hence out piecemeal story bits. And you discover, uh, you, you discover the world, but you also discover the story as you go. That's the last line there. So four years after we started, we finally knew what kind of game we're actually making. We, we consciously cut everything which wasn't core to that, uh, and, and this time for real. So all these things we were tinkering with all cut for real, because they don't, they don't gel well with, with this specific type of game that has a story and, and uh, makes sense. After five years of development, three of them in early access, the game was done. Uh, we held back the last uh, blast-off sequence with a rocket for our final patch, and we held our launch event at Monterey Bay Aquarium in California, live-streamed on Twitch, and then we went on vacation knowing that we had made it because we were selling the game along the way, right? And we already had accumulated two million sales. So before I finish my talk, let me give you a quick tour through our tools and our method that we used. And hopefully there's something in there which applies to you. We're a team of 25 developers, almost all working from home across four continents. We have uh, no product manager, no producer. Uh, we share those re responsibilities as a team. We use HipChat to talk and uh, TeamSpeak for our meetings. We actually just switched to Slack and uh, uh, 
We used Trello, which will come up, and we changed that as well. We use uh, Plastic SCM as a version control system. It's uh, pretty solid now and has a great UI. I can actually recommend it. Um, easy for artists to, to, to work with branches and merge stuff. We use Jenkins on our build server uh, to automate the build process. By the way, the slides will be online, are online actually, so if you uh, just Google me, you, will, you can just get the slides. Um, we use Jenkins for our build server. Um, we also use Jenkins for running our unit tests. And we work in the open. Everything we do is public, meaning not only do we have a blog and a Twitter and a newsletter and headline our websites for each monthly update, we also made our Trello board with all our day-to-day -day tasks public. Everyone can see what we're doing there. And our commit messages are public. People can see live what we're working on. In fact, people can play what we are working on because we are up automatically uploading our daily builds to Steam where they are available on the experimental branch. And it's a broken mess. People love it, especially the streamers love it when something's broken because it's a cool story. Most importantly, though, it keeps us grounded and honest, and we get great immediate feedback. It's a very different thing when a program breaks something and, and three people on the team are affected or 30,000 people out there in the wild are infected. Gets your bugs fixed quicker. <laughs> Can recommend. Uh, but when you're in early access, and we were in early access for like three years, there's nothing more important than community management to manage those expectations, right? And of course, we maintain and moderate our own forums, our Steam forums, our Reddit. But we also have a public Discord server where people can just chat with us directly. All the devs are there. Um, or message us on Twitter. No, just We're all on Twitter. Uh, but the most powerful feature is the feedback reporting system that we built into the game. Players press F8 and at any point in time when they play the game, which pauses the game, takes a screenshot, and then lets them send us a feedback ticket where they write something and goes to us. The feedback tickets are uh, collected on our uh, back end and they are live and public on our server. And we aggregate them and we analyze them. And they also go directly into our team chat and we can reply to a ticket there. So we can, which then goes back into the player who, who wrote it into their game and they can see that we replied directly to them. So we have a two-way communications channel directly to our players. And finally, one word about marketing, or rather the lack of it. Our marketing, marketing budget was effectively zero because we didn't, do, we didn't have to do anything, right? Uh, these days, your most powerful marketing tools are streamers, influencers, and then the stream front page where if you update your game, sometimes you get featured. All those tran translate to sales very, very visibly. And then social media, viral stuff, and then at the very end, press. So let's wrap it up. If you want to build great games, great um, original uh, IPs, we would recommend building prototypes, defining your spikes, and then build a proof of concept, get feedback on it, get feedback early and often, and then iterate, iterate, iterate. Execution matters, it makes a good game great. Listen to your game and adapt. It's probably not what you had planned, but it's something better. So do that instead. Listen to your players and deliver what they want. If they tell you just they want it, just give it to them. Unless, of course, it clashes fundamentally with your vision. In that case, uh, listen to your instinct. Listen to what you want to make. Subnautica, as I said before, slowly gained traction and became a successful product over, lo over a long period of time. We believe in being open, building communities around our games. And that is how we grow our product. And instead of a launch and then it goes down, our, our uh, sales go up, up, up. Uh, never forget, if you do early access, early access is show. People want to be entertained. And you will face a lot of backlash. So you need a community to support you and to defend you against all the trolls. And finally, ship, ship, ship. So, what will you make? That's my talk. Thank you very much. I have a few minutes. Um, I would say, 
I have a, a few tips and tricks, bonus slides. That my, who's a programmer? Hands up. Programs? Okay, I'll do the tips and tricks. <laughs> and then questions we do outside later. Um, so, tips and tricks. Uh, make sure to get your basics right, right? Use a version control system, automate your build process, it will pay off, guaranteed. Unity comes with cloud storage and cloud build, so if you are super small, just, just use that, it's free. Uh, automate as many things as you can. Don't just run unit tests on your code, run tests on your assets too, because assets can break your games just as unit, uh, code can break your game. Programmatically verify stuff like the import settings, that, that they are all uh, consistent across the board. Use Unity Test Runner to automate unit tests and integration tests. Um, you can use Gendarm for static code analysis, which looks super powerful. Um, write modular code that can be tested in isolation. Separate your data from your code. Put your, code, um, put, put your data in scriptable objects. Verify the consistency of those scriptable objects programmatically. Does this look familiar to anyone? That's a broken reference to a material. What if I told you, you can check for broken references programmatically? If you have a big project like we have, 20 gigabytes of assets, stuff breaks all the time, so you need to have some uh, form of automation to, to find these kind of things. So here's the code. Um, take a photo of it or find my slides online. Run this check over all the serialized references in, uh, in scripts and make it in unit tests and run it over your prefabs. And you will find um, broken references. You can go beyond that and verify programmatically that certain fields must be assigned in the inspector. And we use a custom attribute called a certain of null. And then we, it uh, looks like this. So you have a few properties there, the yellow ones. And uh, if those are not assigned, then a unit test will fail. This is the unit test. Um, again, you just run over all your assets and you uh, find those uh, attributes with reflection. and you check whether it's assigned or not. You can do a lot more than just uh, checking those basic things, right? We, we verify a lot of assertions about our assets. We check all our fields for not null. We check our arrays that they are not empty, and then that they contain no duplicates. For our strings fields, we check that they have been localized. For more complex assertions about like scripts and that need a certain kind of setup, we have uh, an interface called iCompile Time Checkable. It's not really a perfect name. And then we just use reflection over all our assets to find those uh, scripts and run a custom check of that, uh, of that asset with that script. We also have some generic uh, checks that apply to all the assets. For example, we, um, are all the mesh renderers referenced in uh, the LODs assigned properly and without, LO, uh, without a duplicate, right? Uh, do all the renderers have materials assigned? Do all the mesh filters have meshes assigned? Do, does each LED level reduce the number of vertices by at least like one order of magnitude? Uh, any colliders negative size? Are any transforms negative scale? Are all the skin meshes optimized and only exposed the minimum set of bones necessary? Are all the transform properties pushed into the colliders so that uh, the transforms itself can be combined into a single game object? All these are things that you can totally check automatically and. Uh, and they not only will make the, your game faster, they will just prevent a, a lot of bugs. And your artists will ha hate you a little bit, but, uh, but it's for their own good. So for each prefab in the project, we check all the fields for broken references, all the assertions for all the scripts. We run general consistency checks for like the LODs and the structural checks for the colliders. And for all the non-prefab assets, we check for broken references and then we ref uh, ver verify the import settings that they are consistent across the board. Uh, and another tip, please spend some time to really, really, really learn Unity. Read the manual, learn about obscure features, get a new Unity deeply, um, for you will be more productive. Learn how to write custom e uh, editor tools, learn about scriptable objects, asset post processes, streaming asset folders, asset bundles, physically based rendering, the animation system, timeline, Unity, audio, Yugi, all those are built-in things, and you don't have to come up with custom solutions, but they have like some weird edge cases, so uh, make sure you spend some time and really understand the tools that, that you're using. Avoid building custom solutions. Use as much Unity as you can, or Unreal or whatever you're using, but in this case, Unity, obviously. 
uh, avoid third-party libraries. Now, this is a bit weird because, but um, chances are some something similar is already built into Unity. Right? You script little objects instead of CSVs or JSON files. You use physically based rendering instead of Marmoset shaders. All code you have in your project, not just your own code, but also all the code you import in, in third-party libraries, uh, is a liability. You own all the bugs and all those co uh, the code because the customer simply does not care whether it's your code or the code that you imported, or Unity, or the Windows driver. So th that's about all I got. Thank you again.